Very warm welcome if you're joining us on YouTube this morning and this session uh, are being broadcast live on YouTube as well. So uh, warm welcome, warm welcome to you. So um, yes, we've been, uh, it's Dharma Day um, and we've been uh, celebrating uh, the, Buddha's, the Buddha's teaching. So Dharma Day marks the, the moment where the, the Buddha first successfully communicated uh, his experience. Uh, he par sort of passed the flame of enlightenment of what he'd uh, he'd realised onto another being, which is a momentous occasion in human history. So, uh, so we're celebrating that today. And um, yeah, in, in a second, we're going to hear a talk from Maitreya Bandhu, uh, who's giving a talk. I didn't write the title down, but I think it's World Teacher, the Buddha's Transcendental Vision. Something like that. Good. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll let Maitreya Bandhu say more about that. But, but this just, but just now, we were with Dani Attar reflecting on our, uh, we were reflecting on our teachers. We spent a session uh, reflecting and meditating on our relationship to our teachers. And so it's a real pleasure for me to introduce uh, my teacher, Maitreya Bandhu. Maitreya Bandhu ordained me, gave me the name Stira Um So yeah, it's a real pleasure to uh, introduce him. Although just before, uh, just, be just a minute ago, he said to me, you're not going to give me a really long introduction, are you? So I've been, sort of, I've been editing in my mind. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I just want to say just two things about Maitreya Bandhu. Um, I want to talk about Maitreya Bandhu as a creative and as a friend. Um, I think Maitreya Bandhu is sort of prodigiously creative. I mean, he trained, uh, he trained as a painter and then, uh, and then more recently, over the last 15 years or so, has been writing uh, poetry. He's published uh, three collections of poetry uh, to date. Uh, he's also just someone who's just got like a sort of creative opinion about uh, pretty much everything. It's amazing. Like we've been repainting our, our kitchen upstairs in the community that I live in. Uh, and you sort of utilise a moment where Mike Trabani is walking through the community to say which paint colour should we choose. And he's got uh, some sort of radical other suggestion that's generally right. Uh, so he's, he's, he's full, sort of, um, full of creative impulses, including what will make a sort of, what will make an occasion, what will make something feel significant. Uh, and I've really benefited from that um, in my time at the Buddha Centre. And, um, and also Maitreya Bandhu is a, is, a, is a very, very good friend. So his name, both parts of his name, Maitreya and Bandhu, have connotations of uh, a friend and friendliness. Uh, as, if, as if once wasn't enough, we need to sort of really emphasise it with Maitreya Bandhu that he is a friend. Uh, and he's a friend foremost. He teaches, in my experience, through being a friend. Um, and most of the time when I, uh, when I meet up with Maitreya Bandhu, we talk about mutual friends, we talk about other people. Uh, he's, he's just very interested in people in a, in a sort of naturally loving way where he can see um, critically, in a positive sense, he can see where where people could go, where they're at now and where they could go. And he's interested in, in helping to sort of clarify that and point that out and help people to grow. Um, so he's a friend to a sort of remarkable number of, number of people and I'm very lucky to count myself as one of them. So um, yeah, I'm really, uh, really pleased to, uh, to introduce Maitre Dandy. So we could put our hands together to welcome him. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stuart Man. That's very nice. That's very nice to see all of you. I was assuming no one would come because of the tennis. Do you know there's a tennis match on at the moment? Yeah, so yeah, welcome everyone. Really lovely to see you all in the shrine room. And welcome to everyone. If anyone is tuning in online, uh, welcome to you. Um, so um, my talk, um, The Buddha's Transcendental Message, World Teachers, all sounds rather grand. Um, in, in a way, just to give you a sort of heads up before I even start, is that you only need to remember four words. Um, but they are very important four words, but you need to remember four words. And the rest of the talk really is a kind of, um, kind of drop-down menu from those four words, a, a set of um, uh, footnotes to those four words. So the four words are no sangha without dharma. Yeah? So that's all you need to remember. <laughs> That's, you know, no more note-taking necessarily. Um, yeah, no sangha without dharma. In a way, that's my, that, that's what I'm particularly trying to sort of focus on. No sangha without dharma. So everything following will be a, will be a, a fleshing out of those four words. Yeah, I thought I'd start uh, personally. Um, I've had a rather difficult uh, week, even a uh, difficult two weeks or so. Um, um, I've got a very elderly mother, very ailing and elderly mother, who every time I phone her, you know, sounds more and more fragile and 
I can easily feel like I really shouldn't be here at all. That I, should, you know, I should go back to where I was brought up in Henley and Arden, a small, small town in Warwickshire. So I have that sort of, I'm sure you've all experienced this sort of torn feeling of, really, should I be coming to give a talk today? Should I be this morning fiddling yet again with a poem? Shouldn't I do something more important, like going to look after my mother, or at least be with my mother? She's on her own, and she's always hated being on her own. And then uh, my partner, for want of a better term, Gary, he's, um, he's had this uh, health crisis. He's, he's, he's suddenly had this real problem that's meant that he's been in a lot of pain and can hardly walk. So today, this morning, I was hoovering his flat. Actually, I'm afraid for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not big on things like that. I don't think I've ever hoovered our community. But anyway, look, (laughs) we don't need to dwell on all those sort of things. But um, yeah, and um, you know, Gary rang me one morning and said, "Look, I I actually can't walk. I can't even get to the kitchen to get a glass of water." So I, you know, cycled up to North London and we went to um, a trauma centre, and uh, in the poor old beleaguered. NHS. Every time you go to anything in the NHS, you feel it's so beleaguered that there's so it's so lacking in money and resources. You can sort of feel it as you go. I'm afraid through the door. It's a real tragedy. It's one of the great idealistic projects of the of the United Kingdom. You you feel it kind of suffering. We were in this trauma ward, um, you know, and with, with barriers between each person for for COVID and so on. And at times like that, we, you know, then I go and see my my mother. I go, you know, I get, I get a train back to Henley and Arden and go and see my my mother, who's just became sort of smaller and smaller. She's she's dying really. Um, you know, um, and you know, life for her is very very hard, um, very very hard indeed. There's very little pleasure in life. So at times like this, for me, I can easily uh, see life if I'm not careful as something that's almost fundamentally. Uh, ugly, harsh, and pointless. Um, when you're waiting for three hours to, in a trauma centre to see a nurse, and then you're told that you'll need to wait another five hours to see a GP um, for somebody that you love in pain, and you know you can feel all the other people around you in pain, frustration. You can feel the staff overburdened, and so on. In those moments, you know, in, in a room with no windows. Um, uh, in those moments, it's, for me, I don't know, perhaps you, you're not prone to this, but I can, I can easily feel that life seems ugly, harsh and pointless. And that's something that I've always struggled with in my life. Um, the, simple, the simple harshness of the human body, for instance, um, that it will betray you, won't it? Sooner or later, it will betray you. And it can betray you in the most seemingly horrific way, of course, it isn't being horrific, um, but it can be. It, it will betray you in all kinds of ways. Um, I've always been drawn in Christian paintings to the to the Last Supper with Judas Iscariot there, and I think he represents a kind of archetype in in our lives where something is going to betray you, something or someone is going to betray you, and that's always there. They're always at the table with Jesus and the apostles and so on. Um, and if it's nothing else, and it will be probably many other things, uh, it'll be your body that will betray you at some point. Um, so for me, that even after practicing for those, like, goes, it takes me back, and I don't know whether it takes you back to that sort of fundamental question of: Is there a meaning in life? You know, um, is there something in the world, as it were, that goes beyond it? Um, that seems to me an absolutely crucial question. Is this it? You know, is life bounded by an infinite sea before birth and an infinite sea after death? Um, in which case it does look, you know, nasty, brutal and short, as Hobbes, I think, said. Um, or is there something in life that goes beyond life? Um, of course, as soon as you say beyond, you, you, you're already getting into trouble from a Buddhist point of view. Um, beyond, like... Every word is a metaphor. Um, you know, when you say, is there something beyond the world, you, in your mind you picture a world or even a universe and something or someone, God or some creative spirit that moves from without the universe into it, sort of outside it. So when I say beyond the world, 
we have to be wary of that metaphor. Beyond is a, is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for something. Um, feels to me a very important one, but it's not to be taken literally. Um, another way of putting it for me is, is there a divine presence or not? Yeah. Um, when when uh, Satyadasa interviewed um, Paul Kingsnorth for Poetry East, one of the things he said that really struck me was that um, if you want to have a culture, you have to have a sacred centre. He was originally an activist, I think, I think in um, the Occupy movement, I can't quite remember. But he's tran- he um, converted to the Church of England because he said that culture needs a sacred centre, that you can have no culture without a sacred centre. Um, so another way of asking this question in those... I mean, it's not even that extreme being in a trauma centre or going to see them, my mother, you know, where there's still war just down the road, and there always is war just down the road. Um, but in those moments, even when you're just brushed by those moments, you have to ask yourself, is there something in the world that is, goes beyond it? Is, does life have any kind of divine presence or sacred centre? Now, I think of the whole of Buddhism as, a, as an affirmation, yeah? um, as a yes to those questions, Um, a great yes to those questions though as you practice the Buddha's Dharma those questions become more and more subtleized Um, Buddhism is trying to get you to ask those questions in a better way in a um, tries to help you see that you're tripping tripping up on something in the questions even on that word beyond you're tripping up on that but then even when you take out the word beyond, you're tripping up on its lack as well, because if you don't have something beyond the world, you can think you just have the world, as if we know what the world is. And that's a tripping up as well, yeah? Um, So Buddhism is saying yes to you. Uh, I felt that very, very strongly when I first came through the doors to the shrine room when I was uh, 25 in something like 19... You know, 23 or something. <laughs> I think I'm about 300 now. Um, I felt seeing the figure, I was at art school, and the idea of having a gold figure would have been, oh, you know, everyone, everyone would giggle. Um, I remember seeing the figure, and it, I immediately saw that it was a yes. Uh, I remember thinking it was ridiculous, frankly. Um, and at the same time, I thought it was wonderful. It, it's saying yes to that instinct for... A sacred centre to a divine and it's saying let's talk more about that you know, let's, let's talk about more of that because it's so easy to get that wrong and you probably have got it wrong is what the Buddha would be saying you almost certainly have got it wrong so let's keep clarifying keep subtleizing, keep refining the question keep real, understanding more deeply what it is we're asking when we say or when I say is there something in the world that goes beyond the world yeah. um, so the Buddha's enlightenment is, and here it is, pictured beautifully in this rather wonderful shrine. Someone said it's camp. I think it is a bit camp, but, you know, <laughs> a bit of camp is just fine. Um, we're not afraid of that. Um, uh, and apparently no soft toys were injured in the... Uh, <laughs> 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 as well. I thought you suddenly cut two people that are pulling top, <laughs> soft toys apart. Which slightly grisly thought, but anyway... Um, so, you know, the Buddha's enlightenment is beautifully decorated today. I mean, it's so gorgeous to see the sacred centre uh, of our life uh, decorated, because that's what you always want to do with the sacred centre. And that's, you see, how culture arises from that very instinct. As soon as you put the, the golden figure in the centre, you burn candles around it, you put flowers around it, you decorate it, you create... You see, it's the beginning of culture, beginning of culture and therefore a beginning of a community. Yeah? But without that sacred centre, there's, culture will fall in on itself and community will keep fracturing. Yeah? Uh, and I'll come back to that later on. But the Buddha represents a new kind of consciousness. Um, we, don't, we don't know what he represents. Um, I don't know and you don't know. Um, but let's for the moment sort of park that, that difficult question. Um, He represents a new kind of consciousness, a consciousness that we literally couldn't imagine. My my favourite metaphor for it is that uh, he represents the majesty of an oak tree to an acorn. 
you know, if you said to an acorn, what is my potential? An acorn would never get an oak tree. Yeah? From, from an acorn's point of view, the, the oak tree would be God. Yeah, uh, and would be as frightening and huge and utterly different as God. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this new um, this new consciousness, this new consciousness, which is a beyond what well, Bhante Sankaracharya says, it's beyond the physical senses and the rational mind. Yeah, um, quite something to say that's beyond the physical senses and the rational mind. It's beyond, and really, pretty much beyond everything we can say. It's beyond the absolutely fundamental categories of self and world, sometimes talked about in terms of subject and object, you and I, it's beyond that great bifurcation of me in here and you out there. It's beyond uh, time and space, uh, which are, I mean, I think it was Kant who first said that they're actually functions of consciousness, they're not, they're not, um, they're not existing things. Um, beyond time and space, beyond subject, beyond object, you name it, really, the Buddha's consciousness is beyond it. It's so, um, you know, it's so, it's so unimaginable that the Buddha's consciousness, as it were, gives rise to all kinds, of, a whole panoply of different figures, what we call bodhisattvas, who represent elements of the Buddha's experience because it's too big to apprehend in himself, you know. Um, but it's, it, it's so difficult to, you know, as soon as you start talking about the Buddha in this way it sort of abstracts him uh, and makes him sound rather rather like a god uh, again Bante Sangratis has said once if you make somebody more than human you make them less than human which I've always thought was very striking so it's, it's often best to sort of tell the story because taught stories tell you so much more than abstract definitions a part of the story that's not in the story, but which I would like to add. <laughs> you can do this when you're my age. Um, um, I, I always think it's striking. It's not. I sort of would like it to be in the story. You know, the Buddha gains enlightenment. He, and I, I won't go through that that element of the story. But I'd like in the story the moment where he opens his eyes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, that moment is an an unimaginable moment. In what it, there's a, the, the ring cycle in Wagner, there's a moment where a goddess, um, Brunhilde, um, she opens her, her eyes for the first time on the world. You know, she's been a, a goddess, and then she... Anyway, long story. Um, um, and she opens her eyes on the world, and there's this incredible music that literally, you know, Wagner says, you know, this chord, she opens her, eye, her eyes at this point when this chord appears. You know, it's an incredible chord. Um, it's sort of transcendental music. And um, one of the things I'd like to get back to somewhere is this, this imaginative sense of the Buddha opening his eyes on, on the world, seen through a consciousness that we can't imagine, in which subject and object, self and world, are no longer bifurcated in the way that we can understand. We can't understand what that then means, but it's a radically new it's, in fact, the first time the world has ever been seen, according to Buddhist thought and legend, uh, with those eyes. Yeah. So he opens his eyes, at least in my story, and um, he realises, he, he thinks very famously that um, what I have now am, not even what I've experienced, because experience is a problematic word as well, but what I've now become, who I, what I now embody, and the body... The Buddha is basically reality embodied. Uh, so easy to say, but actually it's very, very uh, deep. But what I am now, what I've now become, the Buddha, because um, the Buddha wasn't born the Buddha, the Buddha means awake, it's um, a declarative. Um, what I've become, I've become the Buddha, I'm not going to be able to, he has this moment where think, I'm not going to be able to explain this to anyone. I'm never going to be able to get this across. Yeah? Um, now you have to remember in the story that he's already had really very remarkable teachers in which he's experienced incredibly refined mental states where, you know, where, where a, a sphere of infinite space and a sphere of infinite time you know, states of mind that we would consider as being godlike so he's experienced those and talked about them presumably but he's had an experience now where he just thinks I'll never be able to communicate it um, 
And I, what, what strikes me is then he thinks, he thinks of his teachers first. I could talk to them. He's been taught by them. He's clearly been in a lot of communication with his teachers. And he thinks, I could, I could, I could tell them. They, they might get it. They might get it. Yeah. And then he realises by clairvoyance, clairordinance, that they're both dead. And then he thinks about his friends, his five friends. Um, yeah, the, these five friends are often talked about as the five... Um, what are they called about? Five... Ascetics, thank you. <laughs> um, they're often talked about as five ascetics, but again, it's a, it's, an, it's a sort of abstracting tendency in ancient traditions where that sounds a bit more, I don't know, a bit more respectable than five blokes. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, five mates or five friends. Yeah. Um, but basically, he thinks first of all of those who taught him and then he thinks about his friends. Yeah. I, do, I always feel that this hasn't been made enough of this, because, it, because it's in a story, you could easily think, um, well, that's just part of the story, but it's actually quite remarkable that the Buddha, after the Enlightenment, first of all, he thinks, I probably can't communicate this. Then when he thinks of communicating it, he thinks of his teachers and then his friends. Um, because the tradition in India is that you, if you gain some kind of transcendent experience, you just sat there and you waited. People would hear about it and they'd wait and they'd come and crowd around you and watch you. There's, there's been the... I remember a few years ago there was a Buddha boy, wasn't there, who sat for hours and hours and hours in meditation everyone crowded around him eventually. Um, the, 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 the tradition in India, apparently even now, is that people will come to you. Yeah? That your aura will sort of attract people. Um, so it's important to remember that he actually didn't... What, it's always striking to remember what he didn't do. He didn't just sit there and wait. Um, in fact, again and again in the Buddhist sutras, it says, I went to them and said... Yeah, I went... It's, I think it's very, very important. Again, again, one of these little things that we could so easily sort of read over, but I went to them and said... In a certain sense, the whole Buddha's life after his enlightenment was a, I went to them and said... Incredibly active... Uh, not the sort of passive figure that we easily sort of uh, project onto. Um, but yeah, he went. He, he thought in terms of friends. Yeah, basically, even his teachers probably were more like friends. He thought in terms of friends, and I do think that is remarkable. And we need to sort of hold that up a bit more um, because he could have thought of other things. He could have thought of going to the local village or town and preach. He could have thought of going to. Um, the capital and to preach. Yeah? If he was contemporary now, he could have thought of starting his own YouTube channel. <laughs> you know, um, that's presumably what a, some Buddhists would do nowadays. You know, um, or Instagram feed. Um, in, uh, he doesn't. But it, it's very striking to me that he doesn't think of going to the town and preaching. He thinks in terms of friendship, and he thinks in terms of communication. Um, and that says something very, very important about, I think, about what the whole of Buddhism is for those two and a half thousand years since that moment. Yeah? So he doesn't sit and wait. He doesn't go and preach in the village. Um, he doesn't start a political party. He doesn't um, start a kind of social welfare group. He doesn't uh, write a book. Oh, I, I almost certainly couldn't read or write, so that's not surprising. Um, um, he doesn't do those sorts of things. He could have started a in a political party, a group, a pressure group. He could have done all sorts of things. But what he s decides to do is to go and talk to friends. Yeah. Very, very human. So he preferences um, communication, first of all, r rather than preaching or teaching. Uh, he, th he thinks in terms of, I, I'll, I go to them and say. And he preferences a unique, what we might call the sovereign individual. So he, he doesn't think in terms of groups or groupings. He could think of going back to, you know, he's from a princely caste, and he could have thought of going back to that caste. So again, it's fairly common in Buddhist traditions where a figure goes back to where they came from and teach the people in that world. He could have gone back to that kind of warrior caste that he came from and sort of talked to them, thinking that they would understand him because they were a blood kin with him. But he, he doesn't do that. He doesn't go... He does eventually go back and meet his father, but he doesn't, um, he doesn't think of that. He thinks of friendship and thinks in terms of communication. So I think that fact that he thinks in terms of communication and 
from that, and by definition, the unique sovereign individual is very, very important. Yeah. And this, this kind of theme then gets sort of played out in the mythic story of his journey. So he walks um, bare feet um, from where he gained enlightenment. Um, he walks and walks a long, long way to... He knows where his friends are. He, he experiences uh, clear ordinance, as it's called, where you know where people are. Um, and so he, he goes to go... He, he walks to go and see them. Um, and he meets on the road, very famously, he meets on the road... All of you know this story, probably. Uh, some of you on YouTube probably know the story uh, of a, a Brahmin who meets him on the road and is very struck by him. It's interesting in the in the Pali um, sutras, again and again, you get people struck by the sight of the Buddha. Um, there seemed to be something about just the sight of him that had a huge effect on people. So watching somebody who was is often, for instance, um, compared to an elephant or tiger. Um, something that walks very, very gracefully and is very powerful um, is sometimes uh, compared to a bull, a great bull. Um, you know, they're images of great power. He's never, for instance, compared to a lamb. Um, he's, he's compared to a tiger or a leopard or a, a bull elephant or a bull. Yeah. And people are often struck by the, just the sight of him. Yeah. He seems to sort of glow. And I think this is, as in so many things... Um, I've been more and more struck by this sort of this this sort of insight that as above so below, um, you know that mental states have a kind of aura. They, they they're not mental states aren't locked in your brain in some way. They're not just to do with wiring in your brain. They kind of illuminate things around you. Um, they have a kind of aura. Um, uh, mental states have a face, don't they? Um, you know, for instance, you can see very clearly if someone's in dhyana. Uh, when I teach meditation, you, you, I open my eyes at the end of the meditation, uh, and I have not gained enlightenment, but I can see who's in, in dhyana. It's very, very... I mean, it's not difficult. It's not like I've got particular capacity. It's just obvious. Um, they have this sort of incredible stillness and beauty. I remember um, one of my early retreats at um, Vadraloka, there was a teacher there, who you know was not the best looking man in the world, and a small, very long bearded Irish man, Patrick Um And I remember um, going just about to walk out of the shrine room, and I just happened to glance at him, and it was it was like seeing an archangel. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it before or since. He looked like a Greek sculpture or something, incredibly um, still and radiating, even vibrating with kind of life. It, was, it actually drew me up short. Um, he, he died very tragically, he, but he, incre you know, obviously a very, very deep meditator. His <laughs> little story, quite funny man. He, um, he, didn't, he was a bit like me, he didn't always get facts very right. <laughs> um, and at the one end of the one retreat, he was saying, OK, let, we, you know, let's bring, to, he did a retreat, met a bottom, let's bring to mind David, OK, and David. Let's bring to mind John, John, everyone feeling metaphor for John. Let's bring to mind Matthew. Matthew. <laughs> it was, uh, Matthew. <laughs> there, was, there was no Matthew on the retreat. <laughs> Very odd moment where you could feel it all go, Matthew. <laughs> um, so he could get his facts wrong, but you know, this incredible meditation practice, like incredible. I've never seen him once so beautiful. Um, so obviously, that's true at every level. Um, you see it in children, don't they? They light up sometimes. I remember Alex looking at me, and it was so bright. I felt like saying, well, I can't bear to look at you. You know, she was so bright. It was so exquisite. It's almost painful. Um, you see it at every level, and you can imagine at the Buddha's level, it's just an incredible sense of someone uh, that you can never quite explain and never quite categorise, but which you'd have to be almost, um, I don't know, well, closed up, not, not to recognise. Anyway, this, this Brahmin famously says... You look, you, there's something very remarkable about you. Who are you? Um, are you, um, what does he say? For, I don't know what the, 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 the order, but he says something like, are you, um, are you a deva? Are you in like, it's like, and a deva is like an angel. And uh, he says, no, 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 I'm not a deva. He says, are you a god? He says, no, I'm not a god. Um, he says even, are you human? He says, no, I'm not, I'm not that. 
which is very striking, <laughs> going back to what is there something in the world that goes beyond the world. Um, he's eventually, he says, I am a Buddha. Yeah? Um, I'm a fully imperfectly enlightened Buddha. Um, and uh, this man says, OK, I can imagine you could be. And then just walks off. <laughs> you know, um, he's sort of like, OK. Never seen one of those before. Uh, <laughs> and then just walks off. They say he walked off by another path, which I always find very symbolic. You know, that in other words, he wasn't to follow the path of the Buddha, he was to walk off on another path. But I find that, again, very striking, because basically what this Brahmin is doing is saying, what category are you, are you in? Yeah. Um, are, you, are you a god? Are you a human being? What category can I put you in? I, I've never seen... You know, there's something about you that's, that I'm really struck by, but I don't know what category to put you in. Yeah? Um, it's interesting as well, because he could have said, are you a man? And he would have said no to that. Are you a woman? Are you, he'd say no to that. Are you gender diverse? He would have said no to that. Are you straight? He'd say no to that. Are you gay? He'd say no to that. You know, you name any category. I mean, they didn't have that. Categories, I don't think. Lucy hasn't come to us in the Pali Canon. Um, but, you know, you, he's basically saying all of your categories, don't, I don't, I'm not in that. I'm not in any of your categories. It's very striking as well because the Dharma itself, his teachings, are also outside of category. A lot of people ask me, in fact, quite a lot of people tell me that Buddhism isn't a religion. Um, at the moment, I think it is. <laughs> um, Depends, of course, what you mean by religion. Every question has to be uh, investigated in a certain sort of way. But I've had so many people telling me it's not a religion. It's a, people telling me it's a way of life. Um, actually, religion is preeminently a way of life. That's, that's the whole point of religion. Um, but the Buddha's teaching doesn't fit in any category. It's not a religion in the way that we tend to think about religion, especially if you think of a literally existing deity outside time and space. Um, any kind of literal deity is not a religion. And usually that's what you mean by religion, some kind of God uh, that literally exists, literally beyond the world. You see what I mean? Literally outside the world. Um, so from that point of view, definitely the Buddhist, Buddhism isn't a religion. But it's not a philosophy either, because philosophy is nearly always are concerned with thinking and thought. They're not concerned with changing yourself to become like the Buddha. So it's not really a philosophy. It, it, it doesn't fit Buddhism. Buddhism... Um, there's nothing in, uh, in Buddhism that translates to the word Buddhism. Um, ism is a really problematic word already, having that ism on the end, because it sounds like Marxism or fascism or feminism or any other ism, which is primarily a set of ideas um, stitched together into a theory about life. Um, the Dharma doesn't fit in any of those categories. It's like the Buddha himself. It comes from outside of category. Uh, altogether, it comes from something highly inverted commas beyond the world, yeah? uh, beyond time and space, beyond causality, beyond um, you and I, and so on. Yeah. But I'm struck that in that first meeting, in that road, the Buddha is saying, "I don't, I don't fit into your categories at all. Any of them, and, and any of them you could come up with, and my teaching won't either." Yeah? Um, in other words, when you're meeting the Buddha and his Dharma which is not Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism is better understood as different versions of the Buddha's Dharma that you know, have, have grown up over the history, two and a half thousand years history of, the, of, of Buddhism. Um, they're sort of Buddhisms, really. Um, in other words, as soon as you meet the Buddha and his Dharma, it's something, you're meeting something that you don't understand, that's outside of your categories. So it relies on you to be incredibly receptive uh, and so on to understand it. That one of the problems with the Buddha's Dharma is it actually can seem very understandable. Yeah? Um, I have a lot of people trying to teach me Buddhism nowadays, um, including people who aren't Buddhist. But it, it, I, I think, hmm, I'm still thinking about that stuff. Um, it's, it's much, much deeper than you realise, at least than I realise. So he, that, that was his first sort of meeting with someone who... And it's also striking that you can meet the Buddha himself and just think, yeah, it sounds great. But that's it, yeah? So it's qu lots of people come and meet the Buddha here and think, yeah, there's, there's definitely something in this. Oh, I like the rain cloud thing. <laughs> um, and next week I'll do, you know, I don't know, body surfing or, or uh, you know, gone bath or something like that, yeah? Um, 
just just coming just being in touch with the Buddha, even his living presence won't necessarily mean that you'll follow him. You might just go off by another path, and that's essential to Buddhist uh, to a Buddhist concept of freedom. You don't have to follow him. Um, you can go by another path. Yeah, um, I think that's very important to remember. You don't have to follow him, and you don't have to follow his teachings, and you don't have to follow. You know, Sangracha, the founder of our movement and tradition. Um, there's lots of other Buddhisms. You know, you do, there's no have to. If you want to, that's completely up to you. It's your decision to follow him. Yeah. Uh, if you don't want to, that's fine. That's completely fine. It's not a moral kind of ought in that way. It might feel like that to you. It always felt like that to me when I first came to the shrine room that I must follow him. Um, but it's not an ought applied on you from outside that of all the things you ought to do you ought to do this one that ought feels like a kind of existential imperative within you yeah particularly in that and that eventually finds expression in our in our system of practice as asking for ordination yeah? uh, where you feel like i i ought to do this i must do this but in the same way that an artist feels that they must paint not because somebody is telling them they should yeah I think that's better. Anyway, so the, the Buddha keeps walking, um, and you know his friends, these five friends, the, the five so-called ascetics, they see him coming from the distance, and um, you know you again you all know the story, but they think here he is, you know, um, all right, right, oh, here he is. Um, they probably don't talk like that, but um, <laughs> they sort of say, okay, he, he, let, let's. He left us. Because, you know, from their point, they, they were all practising extreme asceticism, and so was the Buddha, or the Buddha-to-be then. And then he started eating, so as far as they're concerned, he broke their rules, he broke their, what they were doing, what they're really about, and they left him in disgust. Yeah? Um, so he, they see him coming, and they say, um, here he comes. That, and it's interesting, because they actually say, in, in the, that's saved in the suttas, it says... Here comes the one who's reverted again to a life of luxury, which is very, very striking, because what you've got there, I think, and this is only in my own reading, is class prejudices actually resurfacing. They're clearly there all the time. You know, that presumably the, the ascetics are all from different uh, castes in India, and caste in India is, a, is one of its great, um, you know, pains and destructive forces. Um, and you can see that when they, one of the things that they go back to is caste issues. He's actually from this rich caste and he's gone back to luxury. Yeah? Uh, not like us who are doing this really tough um, spiritual thing. But it's, so they say, OK, let's not, let's not welcome him. Yeah, let's not welcome him. Let's actually ignore him. Now, I was, I was recently on a men's intensive. Some of you are here and might already be a bit bored by this because you've heard some, a lot of it before. Sam very sweetly shaking his head. Um, um, but I, I, what, what struck me when I was talking about it then is just how rude that is. It, in, I, I come from a, you know, a, a white Western background in a small town. I, you know, in an Indian context... Um, not welcoming someone, not being a good host to someone is extremely rude. Um, that whole culture of hospitality, of putting down whatever you're doing to welcome a guest. Um, Indians are just so much better than, 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 than I am. Um, I recently met uh, Jan of Archer's aunt who, who came to talk to Jan of Archer. And, you know, I, my tradition is... If, if you, you go in and say, hello, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, I, well, I'll leave you to it. Off you go. That's, <laughs> that's what we did in Henley and Arden. No, it, we, it perfectly worked. Um, you know, because everyone was busy. You know, everyone was going. But w I went in to say hello to her, and I could immediately think, oh, I don't do that. Hello, how are you? Done nice to see you, and then leave. I, have to, I sit there, we have cakes, we have introductions. There's lots of chat. I, you know, I ask... There's a whole different thing. You have to welcome people in a way that is completely different to my background. Um, so the idea of the Buddha not uh, being welcomed, of, of somebody not welcoming anyone, especially a friend, of actually ignoring them, we don't understand it in the story. It's extremely rude. Yeah, ex extremely rude. It, it's actually cruel in that context. Yeah? You've actually think, I'm going to be cruel to this person. Um, 
Because remember, they left uh, the, 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 the friends, the, the five ascetics, effectively left the Buddha at the point of death. He, he, and the Buddha to be, in that case, Siddhartha, he says, I was as close to death as I could possibly get. And it's at that moment they left him. Quite a moment to leave your friend, yeah? They're just about to die, and you think, hmm, you're eating rice pudding, I'm out of here. You know? <laughs> you're such a softy, you know. Um, so the, this group of people have actually become cruel, so much so that they will ignore a friend, yeah? They decide to ignore a friend. Um, now, of, what happens um, is as the Buddha comes towards them, once again, they're completely struck by his presence, by something about him which is majestic, is glorious, and which is always tried to be kind of communicated in any Buddha Rupa that you see. Um, the gold leaf is about that. It's trying to, it's a metaphor for that presence. Yeah? So they're struck by something, as it were, golden about the Buddha. Um, and in the tradition, what they do is they, um, one gets a chair for him, one gets water for him to wash and, and they all they do all the traditional things that you do to welcome an honored guest um, they go to, out of their way to welcome him yeah. um, but let's just backtrack to their rudeness because um, it's, it's, it's a very it's a crucial moment in in Buddhist history this really um, or, or, the, or the tradition of the Dharma um, really when they first glanced at him they think he's no longer one of us yeah. he's done something that makes him no longer one of us so don't welcome him give him the cold shoulder yeah. um, so what they're doing is they're relating to the Buddha in terms of a group yeah. they're, they're completely group based they're, actually they might be very impressive people but they're bra bound by group loyalties by group language by the implicit rules that are in any kind of grouping yeah um, you know, I come, as I say, from a small town and there was all these implicit what you could say in this context, what you couldn't say. Every grouping you're in, including a, a Buddhist uh, context, has all sorts of implicit rules, um, all kinds of group behaviours, group loyalties and so on. And group behaviour enables cruelty. Um, one of the things that the 20th century is remarkable for and horrific for is how much the horrors of the 20th century and many of the horrors that are happening just down the road just now are to do with group loyalty. Yeah. They're, they're to do with tribalism. Um, uh, and that was clearly true two and a half thousand years ago and it's true today and it's true for us. It's not like other people are tribal and we're not. Um, I'm afraid I, I wish we weren't. But we might try not to be, but it's very, very difficult not to be tribal in some way. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the friends are actually behaving like a group um, and they're perceiving the Buddha as somebody outside the group. Um, now, one of the things we need to sort of understand, I think, more deeply is our relationship to groups um, because it goes very, very deep indeed and it's not our fault. Um, human beings are group creatures. They're kind of group animals. Um, and there's a lot I've been... I, I was talking to Ian McGilchrist a while ago and... He was reminding us that um, you know there's been a lot of said about power dynamics within groups, but he was really emphasising cooperation in human groups. Um, the level of human cooperation is quite staggering in human groups. Even with, apparently, even with uh, chimpanzees, you can't can't teach them to help each other to lift a plank. Yeah. Um, so you, you know because that that requires a degree of co cooperation. So it's incredible. Our, actually, our group ca capacity. Uh, yes, it can go wrong, but it's also actually quite remarkable. Otherwise, you know, we haven't got claws, we haven't got... Um, we're not that strong, um, we can't run that fast. The only way we could have survived is to survive in groups. And groups are bound together by all kinds of forces. Some of them are negative, yes, but some of them are very, very positive indeed. Um, there were studies, for instance, of a kind of monkey that... Um, they were watching in, in the natural world, and he was, this monkey, see, they thought at first he was an aggressive monkey, and he was fighting all the other monkeys a lot. And then they realised he was um, playing a lot. 
Um, he was actually sort of play fighting with the other monkeys. And the, the groups of monkeys that had one of these monkeys in it, which became known as a sort of social monkey, did much better. Because if a group laughs together and plays together, it creates much stronger bonds within the group and therefore, etc., etc. So even though um, groups can become tribal uh, in, in the worst degree, um, uh, whether that's an identity group, whether that's a national group, whether that's a church group, whatever it is, including, by the way, a non-group, sometimes people are so keen not to be in a group, they become a in a group of people who don't want to be in a group. Um, uh, they become a group of people who are pretending not to be in a group. I mean, I think a lot of our groups are really that, you know, groups of people pretending not to be in a group. And um, as I say, we, we, we need to understand its evolutionary function. Um, very, it's actually very, very important and absolutely crucial to us. You can't get away from it. And especially, you know, if you... I really hope that the NHS doesn't collapse, but you know, before structures like that, the only way you'd survive is if you had very strong social groups. You know? they, they are our survival mechanism, really. But they have this negative side. Um, they have this, are you in the group or out of the group? Are you one of us or not? You know? And you've seen a kind of microcosm of this with the, um, with the, uh, the Brahmin who meets the Buddha. He's trying to say, well, I, I, don't, I don't know, where to, are you with me or against me? Yeah? And that's really effectively what groups do. But they're, when they're pushed, is they say, are you with me or against me? Whether it's the Russian state, the, you know, wherever, it's are you with us or against us? Um, and of course that beca can become really terrifying. Um, yeah, so... The, the, the Buddha is welcomed by this group. Now, that's very important that they welcome him, that they change their mind, yeah? Um, because that opens up another possibility. So they, they don't just think, they don't cold shoulder him, etc. They, they welcome him. Something deep in them recognises something in him that goes beyond them, beyond with those scare quotes. But something deep within them represents, notices something in the Buddha that goes beyond them. And they can't help, it said, and it's stri striking that he uses that language in the, in the suttas, um, they can't help but welcome him. They just can't help themselves. Yeah? So do you see, this, I, I, this is actually the pivotal point for hope in human beings. I'm a bit on the dark side at the moment because of my life at the moment, but this is, I think, the pivotal point of hope. The Buddhism doesn't really have the concept of hope because it's rather problematic, but... Um, that you can be a group and that you can't get away from being a group, uh, and that's absolutely, basically, f a fundamental to human beings and to human behaviour, despite our atomism and so on, which we know is making us more and more unhappy and more and more depressed and more and more self-harming and more and more addicted. That's what we've got to with, that, with a, a world in which we've tried to destroy the group. Actually, we've created masses of mental health problems which will get worse and worse and worse to the degree to which uh, we keep on deracinating, breaking up uh, the group. Yeah? Um, you'll just get more and more strange, etiolated, you know, uh, pained people. Um, it's, it's quite striking. If you study um, people, uh, refugees, actually when they leave their country of origin, they're quite, they're, they're re they're, their mental health is relatively all right. The longer they stay in the US or in another country, their mental health goes down and down and down, even though their wealth goes up. Uh, and it's because you've taken them out of their communal group. So their whole health and so on d d actually diminishes. It's a, it's a massive problem with that whole question of, of um, refugees and so on. Um, yes, but something deep within them, the five friends, wants to welcome the Buddha. Yeah? So that's what we're trying to do here at the London Buddhist Centre. And it's what we're trying to do in Tree Ratna generally, is create what Sangharachi Bhante calls a positive group. I don't think it's a, actually a terribly good word. Um, it, it needs revisiting this whole teaching, really. But a, a group of ordinary human beings, you and I, um, with group allegiances and so on, who are in touch with something that draws them be beyond that, yeah? or in touch with something that means that you can let go of some of the defences of that. Yeah? 
or in touch with something that makes you think, actually, perhaps I've got this wrong. Perhaps it doesn't need to be quite like that. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Yeah? All of those sort of things. Perhaps I shouldn't do... Put, I, perhaps I'll stop giving my opinion on, on Facebook about, I don't know, the ex-Prime Minister or whoever it is uh, that we, we, we want to hate. Um, perhaps, perhaps there's something more to life that I need to dedicate myself to. So that's, that's what we're trying to do in this room now, is create a group of people, a, a Buddhist group, um, which is a group with its strengths and weaknesses, and nurture it so that it's open to something that goes beyond that. Yeah? Actually, I think the best way of putting it is to beyond the group and beyond the mere individual, because Bhante uses the language of the individual, and nowadays that's quite confusing. Um, beyond the mere of in individual, because we're, we're so enamoured of our own individuality. Um, so it, it, it's, it's like a consciousness, a Buddha's bringing into our world a consciousness that goes beyond the group and beyond the individual, I think, is probably a clearer way of putting it in it. Um, and he says to them, the doors to the deathless are open. Yeah. The doors to the deathless are open. I have opened them. I have found the way. Yeah. I have understood the nature of things. I have become the way. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I, I think it's very likely that those words, the doors to the deathless are open, are probably verbatim, because people would remember that. People would have asked those disciples when they met them, you know, only a few years later, what did he first say to you? What did he say when he met you? Now, I, as I said in the men's intensive, um, often this, this time together with the uh, five friends and the Buddha, are often, um, you know, it's often said that the Buddha taught the four, four uh, noble truths, the eightfold path and so on. I think that's almost certainly a later, well, it's certainly a later um, interpolation into the text. And th those things didn't really exist then. The Buddha, was in, in early sutras, you'd actually see the Buddha trying different languages and, and, and dropping them. Like very, very early on, he used the idea of becoming a Brahmin, which is the highest caste, but say, trying to subvert it. It's, it's a bit like we still have languages attempts now, don't we, to try to use a certain language and subvert it. So he tried to use the language of a Brahmin and says, yeah, you, you want to be a Brahmin, but it's nothing to do with your birth. You know, you're born a Brahmin. So he, he used, tried to use the language of Brahmin and subvert it to mean that anyone can be a Brahmin. It's to do with worth, not birth. You know, it was an incredible attempt to subvert the language of Brahminism in a caste system. Uh, actually, quite quickly dropped that. You don't, you don't see it very, you know, from what we can see from text, it, it drops out fairly quickly. So he's obviously experimenting with ways of talking. Some work, some don't work. So he wouldn't have been teaching the Four Noble Path, uh, the Four um, Great Truths and the Eightfold Path, he would have been communicating because he's preference communication over preaching. He's preference friendship over uh, becoming a YouTuber yeah? um, in our modern uh, parlance. Um, so, um, where do I want to go with this? I perhaps need to speed up. Um, Yeah, perhaps a, a little reading of this again is that, you know, it's, it's beautiful in the story because they don't, they don't, they're going to ignore him and then they suddenly gorgeously change their mind, they see who he is. All of them fall about themselves, getting chairs, water, washing his feet, doing all the traditional offerings. The, the, the offerings in the, the, four, the, the shrine bowls at the front there of, a, of a, a shrine, which you always have on a shrine, represent the traditional offerings to an honoured guest. And so, actually, when you see those, they're, they're, they're us making the Buddha welcome. That's what they stand for. Yeah? So they, they, you know, rather uh, neatly do all the things that come to represent those bowls. Yeah? Um, and they do it immediately. But um, they were, they're doing that in, in, in Kairos time, not Kronos time. And this is something I've been struck by recently, is the difference between the two. Um, so in myth, you're... You've got two kinds, in ancient Greek thought, you've got two kinds of time. Which I think it actually, I've only just recently discovered this in a book I was reading. Um, I didn't make it up. <laughs> um, but there's two kinds of times. There's Kronos and Kairos. Yeah? Kronos is, is clock time. Yeah? It's ordinary, everyday time. Um, the time that we're sort of imprisoned in. Um, 
presumably it's the root of chronological and all that sort of thing, chronos, yeah. Kairos is, is a deeper kind of time. I think it's a very important thought, actually, and, and, and has helped me understand quite a lot of what we're doing, even. Kairos is a, a different time of time. It's to do with going from crux to crux. Yeah? It's, it's mythic time. It's, if you think of our lives where major things happen, turning points, cruxes... Um, Interesting, the word crux is, I think, in one of the forms for the word crucifix later. So it comes to mean the crux of something, something that's essential and now, you know, something that changes you. Um, So you're always in a myth talking of kairos time, not chronological time. And that, that, that means that things that would have happened over time and in lots of different ways get get kind of put into a, a different kind of time, in, in Kairos time, in a, in a crux. In the crux, and you can see it's a crux, a, cl- a clear example of a crux. In the crux, the, um, the disciples see the Buddha and they change their mind. Yeah, that's the crux. Yeah? So that's in mythic time. Yeah? But in proper time, in chrono- well, not proper time, in chronos time, in chronological time, I wonder whether you can imagine it like that, that like this, that... Some of them do that. You know, one of the five samples gets a chair. The other one is actually still a bit miffed. Um, someone is a bit resentful still and thinks, I, I just can't believe that he... Just, I, still, I still just can't believe he had that rice pudding. <laughs> That's, like, really bugging me. Um, someone, one of them is perhaps really terribly appeasing because he's um, aware that he has left the Buddha at the point of death and he might be cross. So, you know, that one of them is appeasing a kind of authority figure to, to be nice to him, you know. So, actually, probably what was happening is a whole range of responses, yeah, that any group would have. Some people thinking, actually, I don't know, there's something so powerful about you, I'll respond. This is now in Kronos time, not Kairos time. Others thinking, I'm still not actually sure. And that would have carried on. Some of them were saying... I, I, I just don't know. There'd be discussions, there'd be lots of communication. Um, some, you could imagine one of them still reacting to him and one of them still trying to appease him you know, because he feels bad about leaving. Him. And that's what groups do. That's what our group does. Yeah? Sometimes we're really, really open to the Dharma, really, really open to the tradition, and other times we react to it, we try and appease um, apparent author- authority figures or we try to demolish them, um, we do all of those sort of things that would have happened with those disciples. But what's striking is something outside group behaviour and outside the mere individual has entered into the world. Yeah? And you can see it at work. I mean, again, it gets reduced into this rather neat thing. But you can see it at work. Um, and there would have been all this discussion. There wouldn't have been this sort of the Buddha. You usually see pictures of him sitting on the chair and they're all sitting on the floor listening to him and he just expounds the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. That wouldn't have been how it's like. There'd be times where, they say, you know, one say, did, you know, the, the, the Buddha would be away and one, would, one of the friends would say to the other, did you actually understand any of that? He said, no, I didn't. You know, what was he saying? Well, I think he might. And then one would have got made a bit of progress and the other one would have got jealous and then somebody would say, actually, you know, I'm just not interested in reality anymore. You know, and then, <laughs> oh, come on, come on, we can do it. it seems such a, you know, there would have been all sorts of things that all get collapsed into Kronos time. Yeah? Um, we're actually trying to live that out in chronological time now. Um, so there have been lots of discussion. And then finally someone gets it. Kandanya, according to the scriptures, gets it. Yeah? He really gets it. He understands. Um, he, ca- he understands it. He, he becomes in- enlightened. Yeah? So when he gets it, he doesn't just understand it theoretically because it's not a theory. Yeah? The Buddha's trying to communicate his experience, which is not a theory. It's not an ism of any kind. Um, and uh, Kandanya gets it. And that's the moment, really, that we're celebrating today. The, the moment where the Dharma appears, where somebody gets it and they become enlightened. Yeah? Um, now, that, in that moment, the positive group has become a Sangha. Yeah? Until then, there is no Sangha refuge. Earlier on in the story, which we didn't touch on, um, um, Bardaka and Tapusu, who are the, supposed to be the first people who met the Buddha, um, they actually go for refuge to the Buddha, but they go for refuge only to the Buddha and the Dharma, because there's no Sangha. Yeah? So it's only at this moment, and that's the moment we're celebrating now, that the Dharma creates the Sangha. Yeah? 
Without the Dharma, there is no Sangha. Um, there's just a group, hopefully a positive group, but po- even positive groups, even our positive group, easily slips back into being a, a literal group and then can slip from being a literal group into a negative group. Yeah? Every group can do that. Just as it can become more and more positive, it can also, any group, whether it's you know, a, a, a Buddhist centre or a football team or an identity group or any other group that you come up with, can and often does degenerate into a negative group. Um, one of the things that I've been struck by, again, I won't say much about it because I talked about it before, is, is I've been struck by the myth of Parsifal. And in that myth, Parsifal discovers a holy grail, which is looked after by the knights of um, Monsalvat, which is this magical castle that appears out of nowhere. You can never find it. It's a very beautiful image for the ideal that suddenly there you are in the castle. And so many people must have found themselves suddenly in this room without ever really looking for Buddhism or looking for the Dharma or looking for a sacred centre. They just ended up in this room. Yeah? Um, but interestingly, in the, in the, in the myth, Parsifal has to, is redeemed by that castle and that community of knights. But the community of knights themselves are degenerate. They're already falling apart. In fact, in Wagner's opera, they actually get crueler and crueler as the, as the opera uh, continues. So the, the one thing I was struck by, the myth of Parsifal, is that you go to a, con- a certain context, even a certain kind of grouping, to be redeemed, and your job is to redeem that grouping. Yeah? And you redeem that grouping by, in the Buddhist language, going for refuge and genuinely being someone who goes refuge to the three jewels of the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, genuinely living out a path of love and virtue and courage and so on. Yeah? You don't redeem a group by trying to improve it and in tra- in trying to improve the individuals within it. You redeem a group by exemplifying the virtues of the Buddha's Dharma. Yeah? But you're always doing the thing. You, you need a context to be redeemed in, to use Parsifal's language, and you need to redeem that very context. And that's true at the London Buddhist Centre, it's true in the Tree Ratna Buddhist Order, it's, it's true in any context, that you need that context to redeem you, using the language of redemption, which is very alien to Buddhism, but you too need to uh, then work to redeem that context. And that's a constant mythic form, yeah, that lives, all, all our lives are touched by. So the only way to do that is to um, interact very, very strongly, very vividly, with something that goes beyond both the, the, the group and the individual. Yeah? The only way to do that is to interact very strongly with something that goes beyond the group and the individual. I was thinking of um, classical Dharma study is a, is, a, is a very, very traditional way of doing that. You keep on meeting the Dharma at its most radical and its most uncompromising, a Dharma that isn't really interested in making you feel good, it might do, but it's not concerned with that. Um, retreats are a clear place in which you meet the radical and uncompromising vision of the Dharma, at least I hope so. Friendship, um, spiritual community, um, and so on. Yeah? You need to, I need to keep on interacting with something, a person, a text, a community, that has something in it that goes beyond the group and the individual. Something transcendent. That's why this figure is in the room, to keep on reminding us that in our only two human lives, something goes beyond it. Yeah? So there's no Sangha without Dharma. It's more and more clear that we need to solve, in the world, we need to solve the problem of community. Uh, communities are breaking down very, very rapidly, and it's not working. It's creating untold misery uh, and loneliness particularly apparently you can sort of see studies that just show that we're all getting lonelier and lonelier Um, loneliness depression is now an epidemic um, uh, self-harm all these things that are that that are uh, very much to do with the the breakup and the breakdown in the community you can see why identity groups are becoming so important for people because there's no sense of community and of course the problem with that is that you can easily feel betrayed in, a, in an identity groups. So if we are to survive spiritually and humanly, we need a group, um, no doubt about it. But for it, that group to have the potential of being a sangha, they need to have the transcendental in, in it. 
The, the, the Buddha didn't co-create the Dharma. He brought something from outside of it into human life. Yeah? It's, it's like a, a seed that comes from elsewhere that then gets grown in this soil. Yeah? Um, without, there's no way of thinking, okay, well, the Dharma is a bit tricky and a bit confrontational and, a, and very deep and I, I might not be able to understand it, but let's have community because that's really important because studies show that that's really important. You cannot have community without a sacred centre. You cannot have community without the divine image. You can't have community without the transcendental force in the middle of it. And what happens then, you, so you, you've got this, create, the Dharma is then creating the Sangha. The Buddha expounds the Dharma, the Dharma creates the Sangha. And then what the Sangha do is they go off and they teach and they become friends with others. The language of teaching is probably confusing. They go off to be friends with others for the welfare of the world. Yeah? That's always been the tradition. You get the transcendental experience. You then get it breaking into uh, the group of human beings, going beyond the group and the individual, and then out of that, that being for the benefit of all. So really that's what we're celebrating today. Thank you very much, Pacho Gandhi. Uh, so yes, excuse the doors, they don't like it when we clap. Um, so uh, yeah, no Sangha, no Sangha without Dharma. And um, yeah, I think really evoking, a, really evoking the, our, our, our need, our longing, if you like, for, um, for community, for 